Jesus, it's been a while. How are you? Give me a smile. Oh, that is so great. I know you usually give gifts to me, but it is the season. Oh yeah. Just like this. Good. Oh wow. That picture, you took a great picture. Oh my goodness, I have to tweet it now. So anyway, it's Thanksgiving. Abraham Lincoln was being persecuted in England, so he came over uh, here on a boat called the, the Mayflower. This is way before Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. Coincidentally, like you freed my soul. They jumped down the woods, and they had this big hat on, and they did a song and dance like this. And they were riding around on sheep because they'd forgotten the horses back in England. Muzzle loaders, so they were smashing it in like this. <laughs> A lot of people died that winter. But then Abraham Lincoln said, you know what, we need a holiday. We need people to, you know, be more thankful. They didn't have any food. And they'd never seen a turkey before. <sighs> Basically, that's the story of Thanksgiving. I think now is a good time for me to tell you what I'm thankful for. Orange soda, Atari. I'm trying to think what else. Scarves, capers, carpet, electricity, hats, sandwich bags. Interlock breaks. My church finally does the 2-4 instead of the 1 and 3. That was something that I had brought up last time. Remedied that. I am thankful for the wave at the stadium. If you had an email address, what would it be? I think it would be he lives at heaven. I think that about sums it up. I mean, I should probably get going. My kids are still in the car anyway, so. No, that was, that was fishes and loaves. He doesn't do the same thing with turkey and stuffing. <laughs> Appreciate that, the humor in the, uh, the film. I like how we can use humor sometime to not only uh, uh, capture for us the casual way, I think, but may maybe also convict us a little bit of the casual way in which uh, we uh, approach the Thanksgiving holiday sometimes and maybe even how a lot of people in our culture today approach their relationship with Jesus Christ uh, in such a casual way, if, if they, in fact, they even acknowledge him at all. Uh, I think, too, that this uh, video we just watched today serves for us as a good lead-in to our topic today of of giving thanks and uh, I also think that it's a really neat opportunity for us today to talk about Thanksgiving being able to reflect and look upon how we spent the week of Thanksgiving week and uh, how God had blessed us and and provided for us throughout the week instead of our normal routine of talking about a holiday before it comes about sometimes I think that that is better uh, we're better served uh, looking at things with reflection than maybe with anticipation and I wish that I had time today. I have talked to some of you today, but I wish I could catch up with each and every one of you and talk about how your Thanksgiving holiday went and uh, what all went on for you. Uh, did you get to visit with family? Did you get to stuff yourself with stuffing and, and uh, eat yourself to a coma on turkey? Or, or maybe you uh, went to a gathering and stayed there till 3 or 4 or 5 o'clock and then went out on a shopping marathon and and just hit all the stores for a solid day and a half and then come home and crashed out. Or, or maybe you uh, started off Thursday, started watching a marathon of football, and for some of you today that worked out pretty well yesterday, and for others of you not so much. Huh? I told the first service at least I'm a Western Kentucky Hilltopper fan, and, and that worked out pretty well for me yesterday. Uh, I do want to uh, talk to you this morning about uh, a topic we're going to resurrect or reprise at least uh, an older sermon series we did and, and hit it one more time talking about a relevant word and in doing so we're going to look back to one of the more uh, uh, colorful characters of our Bible and uh, see what he has to say to it. Today we'll be looking uh, at a man named Nehemiah and we'll be using Nehemiah if you have your Bibles we'll be looking through there in just a few minutes. Uh, sometime around the 5th century B.C., a good portion of the Jewish population was taken captive by the Babylonian Empire. And they were hauled back with them and took back and forcibly taken out of their country into exile there. Well, about a hundred years or so after that, the Babylonians were conquered by the Persians and the Persians saw fit 
to allow some of the Jews to return to their homelands. And, and that's where we pick up the story of Nehemiah. This man named Nehemiah, he was one that stayed back with the Persians and himself was the cupbearer to the king of Persia. Uh, today we're going to look at, like say, some of this stuff from Nehemiah, how Nehemiah himself recorded the history of his people during this time. And, uh, and as we do so, I want you to see, first of all, I hope to look at Nehemiah and learn this first lesson from him. The first point on your bulletin today there says, uh, I want you to live a life of gratitude. Live a life of gratitude. Well, what does that mean to you? What does it mean to me? What did it mean to me, Nehemiah? I think living a life of gratitude really refers to a mindset, a, a, a worldview, a way of looking at things, a way of looking at life, being continuously aware that you are a created being who is beholden to a creator, the one that created you. And when in doing so, it's a way that you live your life. It's a way that you walk in the footsteps of God, depending upon Him for all that you have. During those years that the Jews were allowed to return to Jerusalem, a number of them did. And then a number of them, some of them came back and reported to Nehemiah about what they found in Jerusalem. And that's where we pick up the story in the very first chapter of Nehemiah, in the first verse. The words of... <coughs> The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year. While I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are, are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When they, I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned, and I fasted, and I prayed before the God of heaven. You know, I love how when we read scripture sometimes, and we're, we're taking in the account or the, the, uh, the, the record of what is being recorded for us. We, we in, in, uh, kind of get a double blessing from that, in that we also get to see glimpses of the characters that, that they're talking about, looks into their personalities and, and to see uh, things about the people we read about. So in that way, by looking at how Nehemiah reacted to this news that he had just received, we can see some things about him. We can see how he must have approached his life. You see, he had to make a life for himself away from the land of his fathers, the land, the land of his people, in a different world. He had never known anything else. But he obviously continued to live in devotion to his people and their identity as the chosen people of God. I think that speaks a lot to the type of person that Nehemiah was. And it, it reminds me of a person who lives their life in devotion to God and, and what a person like that should look like. He was truly troubled at this news. He was a man who, no doubt, took to heart the familiar words of the psalmist. Psalm 104 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and praise his name. I wonder what that meant to Nehemiah. But I also wonder what that means to you today. What's it mean to you uh, to, to say that we need to enter his gates with thanksgiving, and enter his courts with praise? Where are his gates? Where... Where, where are though? That, that is anywhere that God is. And God, we are always in the presence of God. So are we spending all of our time in thanksgiving to God? Are we always praising his name no matter what the situation? We should be doing that on a daily basis. I mean, thanksgiving is a day that we celebrated here. And we, and we, lifted, we lift that day up as a day to set forth and do those things. But it should be for us a way of life. Living a grateful life should be how we live. And we do try to do that in my family. We're not always successful like everyone else. We're not perfect, but we do try, try to live our lives with the understanding that God is in control in the good times and in the bad times. And we, and we try to look to God with thanksgiving in our heart in all situations. We, we as a family take to heart the advice that was given to us from that great philosopher named Charlie Brown. 
who once looked to his Peanuts fans and to the crowd and said, what if today we were grateful for everything? Why can't we be grateful for everything? In the good times, and as our second point points to it today, we need to be grateful even in troubled times. Nehemiah was very saddened because of the news that he had received from his homeland of Jerusalem. And he had a hard time hiding that. And so the next time he went in to the king to take the king of the wine, the king looked upon his face and noticed it. And he said this to him, picking up in Nehemiah chapter 2, in verse 2. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. But I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and the gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, What is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah. Where, I might, where my ancestors are buried so I can rebuild it. And of course, the king did grant that permission. And Nehemiah was given governorship over the area and he was given the buying power that it took to be able to go and acquire the goods that would be needed to rebuild the city to its former strength. I, again, as I watch and I read this, I see in Nehemiah a man whose love for God and his courage to speak up with the king go hand in hand with a man who leads a godly and a thankful life. And because he led a godly life and a thankful life to God, God answered Nehemiah's prayer and provided a way for him to return and to rebuild Jerusalem. My family and I are first-hand witnesses to how God blesses people that pray to him and that are thankful to him. Back in February, for those of you who don't know, my, my wife, uh, due to some restructuring at her company, lost her job that she'd been at for 15 years. And you know, when you lose a job like that, there's a lot of loss that's there. You know, there's relationships that's, that have been developed with the people there that, uh, uh, that are going away. You won't see them every day like you did. There's, of course, the financial loss, uh, you know, which uh, comes into play when you're putting a son through uh, college and... Uh, some of y'all know about that. Uh, but the, pro the approach that we took as a family was that we were going to trust God. And, and we, we, weren't, we weren't deeply sad and we were just going to trust that God would provide for us in time, in His time. We didn't rush into things. We didn't uh, make Angie, Angie didn't go out and get a job just on the cuff. She waited for the right one to come along. And, and God, and we were thanking so God so much this week as he had provided ways for us to be okay uh, during that time. And, and sure enough, this Thanksgiving week, uh, she was offered a job and accepted a job that was making more money than she did before with better benefits. And we just praise God that we were able to do that. Just as Nehemiah praises God and lived a life thankful to God, God provided for them and he provided for our family as well. And he can provide for you in the same way. So Nehemiah did return to Jerusalem with the king's blessing and set out uh, to the ordering of things and to the assigning of things to get the walls of the city rebuilt. Now this is a monumental task as you can imagine. All, all the walls we've talked about around Jerusalem in years past and, and all the gates that you've heard about were all turned and or tore down and burned and they had to rebuild them all. A monumental task. And, and, it, and there were other things, there were other factors going against Nehemiah and the group. There were uh, outside people groups outside the city that, that didn't want to see the walls of Jerusalem built because they were afraid that uh, that would infringe upon their territory. And so a lot of those people, uh, especially the Samaritan groups, you know, they sought militarily and, and through sabotage and things to thwart the efforts of Nehemiah and the people to rebuild the walls. But God again provided for them and those attacks were unsuccessful. In fact, the, this massive undertaking, this massive building program was completed in a miraculous 52 days. 52 days. 
How long did it take them to build the bridges here with all the modern equipment? Being a people of God, we must learn to be thankful even in less than ideal conditions. To me, that is a true sign of dependence upon him. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 reinforces this. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And so when God does provide for us, we must thirdly today give thanks for answered prayer. Now, I'm not sure what your Thanksgiving day looked like. We talked about that a little bit. But here in, this, in uh, the book of Nehemiah, we have a picture of what Thanksgiving looked like for those Jewish people at the time as they came back and saw their walls rebuilt and their things reestablished. Uh, picking up in chapter 8 of Nehemiah in verse 1, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the, of the law of Moses which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the four, first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand, and read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. So there's this massive gathering of people and... <clears throat> right next to this new wall that's been built and I want you to think about how those people must have felt that day you know think about the oppression that they had been under for so long think about how they had been praying and their fathers had been praying and their grandfathers and gener several generations of people had been longing for this day when they they would be able to return and be a people again and to, to identify as God's chosen people and to be in the city that represented them so well they were deeply aware and they were deeply appreciative of what they now had. They, they read the word of God together and, and we won't read it all today, but they did more than that. They, you know, they celebrated, they had a feast and, and they celebrated the, the, the Feast of Tabernacles, which was a time that they got together and, and built little outside dwellings to commemorate the provision of God for them and the way God had delivered them earlier in their existence from the hand of the Egyptians. And it was a week-long celebration for what God had done for them. I wonder what, what that sense of thankfulness was like for them. I mean, I can imagine it in a small way of a sense of thankfulness that we felt after this time of uh, Angie looking for work. But so much bigger, so much greater was their time. I wonder how many prayers in those hundred years were lifted up to God for the restoration that came that day. And, the, and what I want you to notice is that when that restoration came, they didn't just let it pass by. They, just, they didn't just let it go. They gave credit where credit was due. And they lifted up thanksgiving to God. The people gathered together to praise God and give him thanks for the completion of the wall. God had been good to this uh, generation of Jewish people, allowing them to come back and rebuild that city. Uh, but I want you to see something else, too. I want you to understand that in rebuilding the city, things still weren't exactly perfect for them. I mean, they were still under the rule of the Persians. This King Artaxerxes that Nehemiah worked for was still ultimately their king. But even in the midst of that, they still found a reason to be thankful, even though things weren't going to be exactly like they wanted them. Uh, the spirit of celebration is captured here in chapter 12, in verse 27. It says, At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals, harps, and lyres. Do we as people really give thanks for the good in our lives even when those blessings aren't always perfect? You see, we live in a broken world. We live in a world that, that, that because of sin and because of circumstances and because of a rebellion is a fallen humanity. But I, I like how someone said it once when they said, if we waited until the situation was ideal to rejoice in God, that moment would never come in this life. God should get the glory and God should get the thanks in every situation. We must as, in Colossians 4.2 says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful 
and thankful. So how do we do that? How do we devote ourselves to those things? How do we align our lives? How do we live in that life of gratitude? How can we be people who know that it is from our Creator that we receive that blessing? You see, we know this today, and, and we can have access to that because we can have a relationship with our Father. A Father that, uh, that sent His Son, His own Son, to take our place and to be the, the, uh, and to be the substitution for our sins and our transgressions that we should have been punished for. And when we believe in Jesus Christ, we become adopted by God. We become ourselves the sons and the daughters of a king, of the king. When we have that relationship with him. And my friends, when we do that, that's what we should be the most thankful for at all. For that relationship that we have with Jesus that allows us access to a God that hears our prayers. It's the most wonderful thing. And, and we should live that not just on the day of the American Thanksgiving holiday, but each and every day of our existence. So fourthly today, and not really as a, not really so much as a sermon point, but kind of something to just take and leave with you today. You should be immeasurably thankful for your identity in Christ. Immeasurably thankful. I love how Paul shouts it out in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, where he states, But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. You see, none of this means anything. None of us uh, can consider the blessings of God and how he blesses us unless we have that relationship with Jesus. If it weren't for the cross, we couldn't have that access to the Father. So simply put, we should be thankful today for, for Jesus' life, for his death, for his burial, for his resurrection, and for his victory over sin and all its consequences. That's what I'm most thankful for. And I can honestly say that as I stand before you today, I am the most thankful for that that I've ever been in my entire life. I want to tell you, uh, to, uh, tell you a little bit about how our Thanksgiving week went. We talked about how Angie got the good news of her job and how God's been providing for our family in different ways. And, Jonathan's home from school and a lot of things to be thankful for. But I want to tell you about how Thanksgiving Day went for our family. First of all, I took, uh, I took overtime at my job. It's uh, usually off on Thanksgiving, but they called, and I went in from 7 to 3, 8 p.m. Uh, you know, already setting up to miss my parade that I watch or cooking the turkey like uh, sometimes I have to do. Uh, so I did that and got off at 3 o'clock, planning to meet Angie and the kids over at the in-laws for uh, Thanksgiving dinner. And I knew it was going to be tough to hook up with my parents uh, Thursday as well, but I thought maybe they, if they were eating later, I could come over then. So I called my mom and I said, uh, what are you guys going to do uh, for Thanksgiving? She said, well, we're going to the Cracker Barrel. I said, but she told me, she said, and I'm eating your sister's there, but your dad's not going. He doesn't feel well. I said, oh, yeah, what's going on? And she said, well, he's uh, got some, we think he's got some sinus stuff and his ears are bothering him and he fell today and kind of cut his arm a little bit. And I said, okay. Uh, well, uh, and I knew it sounded weird that he didn't want to go to Thanksgiving dinner because he really likes to eat. Uh, so I, I said, okay, well, I'll check back later. Well, I went on to my in-laws and we had a great meal and it's time together and watch some football. And about 7 o'clock, I said, I'm going to call my mom. And I went outside and I said, hey, mom, what are you doing? How was dinner? And she told me, she said, we're sitting here watching the Wheel of Fortune now, which is, I guess, the normal routine for 7 o'clock on a weekday night. And uh, I said, uh, well, how's Dad feeling? Well, he's not feeling too good. He's, he's still kind of bothered, and his arms are bothering him. I said, oh, yeah. And so I said, well, keep an eye on him, and I'll call you back. Well, it wasn't very long she called me and said that, that uh, he wasn't feeling very good at all. He wanted to go to the hospital. I said, okay, I'm on my way. I'm going to come and get him. So I got in the car in Fern Creek and got to go to Valley Station. About halfway through, I get a call and says, your dad's laying on the floor shaking, and he's asking to go. He says he thinks he's going to die. I said, Mom, hang up the phone and call 911 right now. So Mom called 911, and by the time I had made it from Fern Creek to Valley Station, there was a fire truck and an ambulance in our driveway. And uh, there was about 15 firefighters and EMT workers there, and they were 
already hauling my dad out on a gurney and I noticed that he was strapped down and shaking and I looked in his eyes and I could tell that he didn't even know who I was. And I asked the EMT, I said, what did he try to fight you? He said, no, we think he's having seizures. Do you, uh, does he normally have seizures? And I told him no. And they said they were going to Jewish. So I went in and wrapped up things in my mom's and we followed them to Jewish. Well, we got him to Jewish hospital and took him to the emergency room. And we went in and, and the doctors worked on him and they got him calmed down and everything was looking better. And they said they think it maybe he'd had a stroke. And uh, he still had some movement though. And uh, we were thinking things were going to be okay. And uh, in fact, uh, my dad's a big LSU football fan, and LSU was on Thursday night, and I went in there and turned it on in the emergency room, and uh, room he was in, and we watched, and he even talked about a little bit about the game. But then he started having seizures again. And they were giving him medicine, and he couldn't, they, they just couldn't get him under control. And he was shaking so violently and grabbing so hard on the thing and, and just, just screaming that, it, that, we could, that he couldn't be helped, and he was worried that he was gonna die. There was one point where his breathing got so bad that I thought it had stopped. And they'd already told us that they were just about out of options because they'd given him all the seizure medicine they could give him. When I seen what I thought was his last breath, I, I ran from the emergency room. And I went out in the lobby where my family was because I wanted my sister to be able to come in and see him one more time. So I sent her in and I immediately grabbed the hands with my family members here. Some of them are here today, Peyton and Jonathan and Emily, and Dave, and all of us gathered there that were there. And we just started praying. And I was sobbing and crying. And I don't even know what the words I was saying were. And I was convinced that I'd seen my father pass away. But then while we were out there, apparently they gave him one more dose, the last possible dose they could give him of the seizure medicine, and he was able to pull through. And I don't know exactly what I prayed for out there, but I do know that I prayed that no matter what, that God would take that fear away from my father that day. And he did. Now, we're not out of the woods, but my father is doing much better, and he's in ICU at Jewish Hospital, but long road ahead. But I feel like, as I stand before you today, that God answered my prayer that day, that Thanksgiving day. And I've never been more thankful for anything in my life. Now, God may have chosen to take my father that day, and I was okay with that. Because that's the will of the Father, and he knows better than I. But I do know that God heard my prayer. And I know that God heard my prayer because at one some point in my life, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And I have access to the Father. And he loves me and he looks down and he takes care of me. And I know he'll do the same for you. I'm not sure what your situation is. But I know that, that you want to have access to the God that created you. And if that's the case today, in a few minutes we'll offer a time of invitation. And that'll be your time to come. And share and pray with me. In that case, let's pray together now. Father, I thank you so much for this day. Father, especially this week. I'm more aware of your presence in my life than I have this week. Oh, so many ways you bless my family. Father, just taking care of us, giving us a good place to live, good friends, good people, good church, and a lot of love. Father, the most important thing today that I think about is that as I rejoiced in the Angie's job this week, or uh, cried out to you in the moment of weakness when my father was very ill. Father, I know that in all those situations, you're in control. So, Father, I just continue to ask that you allow me and all these people here to continue to live a life that is always grateful to you for the blessing that you give us now. Well, as I said a moment ago, there may be people here today that don't have that relationship with Jesus. Father, I just, I don't know how, what I would do if I didn't. I don't know how we would get by if we didn't have that way to plug in and that hope for a greater existence even beyond this world. So, 
Father, I don't know what keeps people from believing in your Son and being baptized. Father, whatever those blocks are today, I pray that, uh, that they're taken away. Today would be the day that that relationship would begin anew. And just like the walls of Jerusalem, the walls of their lives, their lives would be rebuilt on a new and better foundation that's found in a relationship with Jesus. Father, that's the hope of my soul. And I pray all these things in the name of your son. My friends, if you have a decision to make, as we sing, I'll be down front. There'll be others at the back. Step out and let's talk to them.